because the 1920s were seen as this period of economic growth, Americans were excited entering the year 1929. The economy seemed good coming out of the Roaring Twenties, and a new president, Herbert Hoover, declared that our economy would continue to grow. But there were problems that existed in the economy that people hadn't recognized. There was this use of what's called buying on margin in regards to the stock market. The stock market was seen as like the symbol and of wealth, of growth in America, but under buying on margin, people bought stock by paying only a small portion of the price of the stock and borrowing the rest. As a result, they thought they had more money than they really did. Also, you saw like what was called binder fees, which was a type of land speculation where people would pay for the right to buy a land, a this binding fee that they would buy the land at some future point, but they didn't actually buy the land. So it looked like, again, that people had very large real estate portfolios that than they really did. Uh, farmers had taken out loans to buy more land and machines like tractors to help grow more crops. So there was all these bad economic practices going on. The economy was not as good as it seemed, but people didn't realize that until October 29th, 1929, the stock market in the United States will crash. This is known as Black Tuesday. Stock, mark, stock prices will fall by over half in one day. As people sell their stocks, prices are going to fall further. Investors are going to lose everything. The stock market crash doesn't cause the Great Depression. All these bad economic practices caused it. It's the stock market crash, though, that sets it off and is seen as the beginning of what we call the Great Depression. As people start to lose their money, we get what are known as a run on a bank, a run on banks. In this, people get scared and the rumors circulate that the bank is going to close, is going to run out of money. So people rush to take their money out of the bank. As more people get their money, eventually the banks run out of money and those that didn't get theirs lose everything. So it creates this panic of people having to get their money before the bank closes. Crop prices are going to fall from overproduction and Bankers are going to call in the loans on farmers and other people that the banks had given out during the 20s. But now that people can't pay it, the banks are going to foreclose on people's farms and homes. But because there's so much unemployment, so many people have lost their jobs, the banks own these farms and homes, but they can't sell it to make their money back. And as a result, over one third of Americans will become unemployed during the 1930s. President Herbert Hoover will do nothing at first to address the depression. He felt that it wasn't the government's job and that the depression would right itself. Uh, he felt the depression would not last long. And so he said it was not the federal government's job to help people during an economic depression. He said it was up to the state and local governments, as well as private relief organizations like churches and charities were the ones that should provide relief to people who were out of work, who needed food. Uh, over the next four years though of Hoover's presidency, Things continue to get worse. Uh, Hoover and the Republicans who were in charge are going to receive most of the blame. Examples of this, that Hoover's name will get applied to a lot of the elements. A homeless camp will become known as a Hooverville. A newspaper will be known as a Hoover blanket. And because so many people had lack of food, a dog will become known as a Hoover steak. That, that's all that people had to eat. In Texas, we're going to see a, a, a boom in oil and then a bust in cotton. A major oil field is discovered in East Texas in 1930 by Columbus Marion Dad Joyner, uh, discovers the oil near, near Kilgore. And the wells are going to be drilled like even in the middle of the town. There's so much oil there, like in people's backyards. Um, as these oil discoveries, though, it's going to lead to lower oil prices. Major oil fields are going to flood the market with oil, causing prices to drop. Oil will go from $1 a barrel to $0.46 cents a barrel. As a result, drillers are going to produce more oil to make money, causing prices to drop even more to the extent that in 1931, the Texas Railroad Commission will order drillers in East Texas to limit their production. Although drillers don't like that being told to not produce as much oil as they want, so small companies are going to ignore it and they're going to produce what becomes known as hot oil, oil which is produced in violation of this order. Drillers are going to smuggle oil at night out on trucks. And as a result, by 1932, price of oil will fall to 13 cents a barrel. 
Eventually, the governor will have to call out the National Guard to restore order in East Texas to put an end to the hot oil. Cotton prices are going to drop also. In the 1920s, cotton prices begin to drop, and this continues during the 1930s. Farmers are going to continue to produce more cotton to make up for lower prices, driving the prices of cotton further down. Uh, as farmers refuse to cut production, they're going to lose their homes and land when they couldn't pay their debts. As throughout Texas and the West, you see people who, once they lose their homes, are going to move, and they're going to move west to California the, uh, because there were rumors of jobs in California. These people are going to have the nickname Okies, uh, tying it into Oklahoma, but it's anyone from the West who will move to California looking for jobs. Many kids are turned out by their parents, uh, teenagers and you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds who the parents can't provide for them and the kids are turned out and said you need to just go out into the world and try to make a living for yourself. So we start to see people uh, riding the rails illegally looking for work, uh, young people especially. With the demand for cotton and wheat high during World War I, farmers brought lot more, lots more land into cultivation. But as they did this, they removed natural grass and trees that served as windbreaks and held down the topsoil. So not only do we have low cotton prices during the 1930s, but we also have a massive drought that will hit the Great Plains. It will kill what crops are there. It will dry out the soil. And what it'll lead to is what's known as the Dust Bowl. This massive, eco, one of the worst ecological disasters in world history. And as strong winds will blow, it will create these massive dust storms that will spread, stretch all the way from Canada to the panhandle of Texas. Uh, the blowing dust will get into people's homes. It will kill livestock. It will kill people. Uh, you know, causes lung problems, which known as dust pneumonia. If you get caught, people who got caught out in it and animals would suffocate to death from the dust. Uh, the dust bowl is going to be a, a massive problem. Another problem we see is that with so many people out of work, the West uh, of the United States, which includes Texas, is going to see an increase in bank robberies of desperate people robbing banks to make money. One of the more famous set or team of bank robbers comes from Texas. Uh, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow are going to lead a gang commonly referred to as Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, their gang was called the Barrow Gang, and they're going to rob banks, gas stations, stores, things like that throughout the 1930s. They will kill 13 people, including nine cops. Uh, they're finally ambushed by an armed posse led by Texas Ranger Frank Hammer in Louisiana. Uh, the cops will open fire with machine guns, killing Bonnie and Clyde instantly. Their car will then crash, uh, but the cops kept shooting to make sure that Bonnie and Clyde were dead, uh, and they will become sort of folk heroes. Others, we had the Newton boys who would rob banks in the Abilene area. And in Cisco, a little earlier in 1927, you have the famous Santa Claus bank robbery. Well, in 1932, we have another presidential election. And who, President Hoover is not very popular because of the Great Depression. And the Democrats will run Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt will run, his program is called the New Deal. And he says that he's going to make a new deal for America and he has this plan to help bring about aid and to get America out of the Great Depression. And as a result, um, since Hoover had done, almost, and the Republicans had done almost nothing to help the country during the Great Depression, things are worse, and FDR is going to win, and he's going to win big in one of the largest landslide elections in American history. Also, his vice president is a man named John Nance Garner, who is from Texas. And under FDR's plan called the New Deal, he has what he says are the three R's, relief, meaning get food and aid to poor people, jobs for the unemployed, you know, immediate relief. Once we get relief, we have recovery, get the banks and the economy going again, and then reform, set up laws to bring about change so that a depression like this doesn't happen again. FDR takes office in 1933. He's sworn in, and in his first hundred days, he's going to create a whole lot of programs and agencies to help with the depression. So his hundred days, first hundred days, is a marker for presidents after this to see what they've accomplished. And these organizations, we refer to them as the alphabet agencies because they're usually referred to only by their initials. 
So his idea to provide relief and job effort, the first one is the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, or the FERA, which gave money to states to create jobs for people. Many states like Texas only created jobs for people who supported the politicians and for white people. And so the FERA is not going to be as effective, so the federal government's going to take over. Uh, they'll create the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, where the government will hire people to work on cities, build roads, do all sorts of other projects. They'll hire artists to paint. Uh, they'll, we have the Texas Post Office murals that artists will be paid to paint murals in the post offices. Writers are hired to write plays and books and to historians to go around and get oral histories from people, actors to put on plays. They'll just hire any lots of people to do lots of jobs, the government just trying to get people working. Another group is the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. They will hire young men, a young single men, and the job is to work in the country building parks, doing conservation efforts. So it's taking them out of the cities to national parks, to state parks, places like that to do conservation effort that gives the young men jobs and helps out the country. Uh, in Abilene, the Abilene State Park was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. We also had the National Youth Administration, which hired young people to work in the cities. In Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who will go on to be president, is going to head up the, uh, the NYA. And then we had the Public Works Administration, the PWA, that is going to build stuff to benefit the general public. It's going to build buildings, city buildings, things like that, schools, bridges, dams, these large projects that will help out the public. In Abilene, Franklin and Jefferson Middle Schools were built by the Public Works Administration. Farmers also needed help. So under the alphabet agencies, we see two main programs to help farmers. The first one is the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the AAA, which uh, tried to help farmers with low crop prices. What the AAA did was it paid farmers to plow up a portion of their crop so it would reduce the surplus and drive prices up. Uh, it also paid farmers for what's called crop rotation, a program that's still around, that planting crops other than cotton during other seasons that would add minerals back to the soil, such as soybeans and watermelons, and this would also work to end the Dust Bowl. And then another one is the Rural Electrification Administration, the REA, which provided electricity to rural areas that had not had electricity before. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, during the middle of the 1930s, in 1936, Texas is going to celebrate its centennial, its 100th anniversary of its independence from Mexico. And Texas decides they want to have a grand fair to do this, and they will hold this fair in Dallas at Fair Park where the, and do it in conjunction with the Texas State Fair. Uh, it's going to become a major event. 50 buildings were used or built. Most of them are new. And six and a half million people will attend the Centennial Fair in Texas. And it'll become a major event. Movies will be filmed there and things like that. All right. Well, in Texas politics during the 1930s, um, Miriam Ma Ferguson, like we said, was elected the first female governor of Texas in 1924. Her husband, Jim Ferguson, had been governor, but he was impeached and removed from office. When she ran in 1924, she ran under the slogan of two governors for the price of one. So it made people think that, you know, Jim would still be in charge. But her election, like we said, is important because it broke the power of the Ku Klux Klan in Texas. Well, in 1930, Ross Sterling will win as governor. He will defeat uh, Ma Ferguson. And Sterling's going to try to stop the falling cotton prices. He's going to push for a law that sets limit on the production by farmers. Uh, this law is going to be ruled unconstitutional, and Texans will blame Sterling for the growth of the Great Depression. As a result, in 1932, Ma Ferguson will re-win the governorship, uh, and she's going to create what she calls bread bonds to help feed hungry Texans. Uh, these are pieces of paper you know, that they can turn in to get bread from the state to help feed their children, uh, and also help, she helps Texas get federal relief funds. Uh, she is, though, going to uh, create some tension that she's going to fire a lot of Texas Rangers and replace them with people who supported her. Um, in 1934, we have our next election, and James Allred is going to defeat Ferguson to become governor. He's going to be reelected in 1936. 
and under him he will reorganize the Texas Rangers. He'll also set up a retirement system for teachers and state employees, the Texas retirement system, which we still see today. He will increase increase support for education, uh, but the state legislature will refuse to raise money for these programs. So while he sees these programs created, we see this divide in Texas politics where the legislature, which controls the money, won't fund them. Well, following Allred, we get a new governor in 1938 who's also reelected in 1940 named Wilbur Lee Papi O'Daniel. And O'Daniel is kind of interesting. Uh, he had no political experience when he was elected governor. He owned several flour mills in Dallas. He owned a, a, he would sell the flour, specifically biscuit mix. And he also, though, got involved in mass media, specifically radio. And he bought several radio stations in the Dallas area, and he hosted a popular radio show called the Papio Daniels Pass the Biscuits Hour. And he would have country singers, and he was on there. And so people knew him as a radio media entity. Uh, his theme song he wrote was called Beautiful Texas, which is still a Texas song today. Um, he's not going to do much as governor. Uh, he's not real, by the end of his term, people realize he's not really an effective governor but he shows the power of media to help politicians win in this transition to, again, the role of media in political elections and the importance of the new medias. During the 1930s, we see African Americans in Texas will push for civil rights and will play a, a large role in national civil rights. Dr. Lawrence Nixon, a doctor from El Paso and was part of the NAACP there, is going to play a major role. He's going to, in 1927, challenge the all-white primary in Texas. His case will go all the way to the Supreme Court, which is known as Nixon versus Herndon. And in it, the Supreme Court will rule that Nixon's right to vote were denied, and the Supreme Court struck down the all-white primary in Texas as unconstitutional. Another major leader is A. Maceo Smith in Dallas. He will start the Texas State Negro Chamber of Commerce to promote African-American owned businesses. Uh, he's going to be a major prominent figure in Dallas politics for the next several decades. And then Lyndon Johnson, like we said, who was uh, the head of the National Youth Association, he is going to, uh, under the New Deal, the NYA, he is going to give jobs to African-American youths in Texas. He's one of the only southern states, or Texas is one of the only southern states, because of Johnson's leadership that will provide jobs to African-American youths. Uh, Mexican-Americans are also going to organize during the 1930s. In 1929, the League of United Latin American Citizens, known as LULAC, will be formed in Corpus Christi. This is a major organization for Mexican-American rights, and it's going to fight against discrimination through protests, but also legal actions. Another person, Emma Tenyaka Brooks, a Mexican-American woman in San Antonio, is going to be a labor leader, and she's going to fight for the rights of Mexican-American workers, especially in San Antonio. Um, she will lead several strikes, one of which uh, against a company that owned 400 factories in San Antonio and that employed people to shell pecans by hand. And she will lead this pecan sheller strike and will win. Uh, the women at the time made $2 a week, and the factories had no indoor toilets for them. When the strike is over, the women will get better pay and better working conditions. Uh, other Texans will have an impact nationally on American culture uh, through sports and music and fine arts and stuff. One a lady, Mildred Babe Diedrichson Zaharias, was an athlete from Beaumont, and in 1932 at the Olympics in uh, Los Angeles, she will win two gold medals and a silver medal. She will win her gold medals for the hurdles and the javelin and her silver medal for the high jump, making her the only woman to win a medal in, in a running, throwing, and jumping track event at the Olympics. Uh, she will go on to play professional golf and professional tennis, winning the Grand Slam in professional tennis. She will win numerous prof professional golf tournaments on the Ladies Professional Golf Association and at the time of her death in 1945, when she passed away from colon cancer, uh, to the present day, Babe Diedrichson is considered by many the greatest female athlete of all time. Another is uh, slinging Sammy Baugh. He was a quarterback from Sweetwater who went to TCU while at TCU. 
He uh, was a two-time All-American and led TCU to two Southwest Conference championships, as well as bowl victories in the Sugar Bowl and the inaugural Cotton Bowl. Uh, he will be drafted by the Washington football team and will lead them to two NFL championships and is in both the NFL Hall of Fame and the College Football Hall of Fame. Uh, a fourth person, Byron Nelson, is a professional golfer who will dominate professional golf throughout the 30s and 40s into the early 50s. He will win 64 uh, PGA events, which is still the record for the most PGA events today. And then culturally, we have Gene Autry uh, from Texas, known as the Singing Cowboy. He will start out on radio, but he will then move into movies and later television. And he will act in this. And so he's a cowboy and he'll sing. Uh, he'll write very popular songs, Happy Trails, Back in the Saddle Again, but also Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer are Gene Autry songs. And he's going to help spread the image of the Texas cowboy to the world, but will also help influence American culture. As the 1930s come to an end, though, we're going to see global events that are going to shift the focus away from the Great Depression that will pull us out of the Great Depression and will get Texas and the United States involved on a global scale.